Well, so it's Labor Day weekend. We did a pretty good job of showing up. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. You know, since we're in this, this mindfulness series, I had to stop and think about what is Labor Day. It's, it's a day off. When I was going to school, it was, you know, that little break after starting school and you got, I can't get, then all of a sudden got three days off and went back and, you know, it's Labor Day sales. But really, anybody have some thoughts about what Labor Day really is? I was kind of at a loss myself, right? So I looked up and found this, it says, it's a holiday that is rooted in the late 19th century when labor activists pushed for a federal holiday to recognize the many contributions that workers have made to America's strength, prosperity, and well-being. So a time for us to be mindful of that constant work that we're all doing and mindful of those who are doing the work that add to our well-being and our prosperity in life. And so before this moment, I, or this preparing for this moment, I had not been mindful of what this holiday was about. And really, that's kind of representative, representative of how we sort of live our lives, right? Does anybody have a guess of how many thoughts we process in a 24-hour period? anywhere between 7,000 and 70,000 thoughts in a 24-hour period. So thinking about the past, thinking about the present, thinking about the future, thinking about are you going to like this message, is this appropriate um, attire, all these things are rushing through our minds. And researchers say that 47% of our day, we're not focused on the present. We're focusing on all these other things. And so this series really is important to learn how to be mindful, to live our lives with mindfulness so that when we are focused on the present, it's meaningful. You know, the title for today is Reclaiming the Present Moment and Your Life. You know, um, I loved what Cass said. I was trying to find her. I loved what Cass said about the, what you said something about that um, life is bursting out all over. But if we're in that 47% where we're not focused on that life, we're not experiencing that. We're not experiencing life as it is today. So... I'm wondering, you know, if anyone has some thoughts you want to share about what is mindfulness and how we might practice it. Any thoughts on first, what is mindfulness? Just throw out a few words. Paying attention. Paying attention. Breathing. Breathing. Intent. Intent. Intent, right. Right. Being present. Being present. Concentrating on the moment, this moment. Well, it was, uh, it was great to be able to see what our kids are learning with Lisa around mindfulness because she's mirroring what we're doing with the kids. And so she shared with me this picture of the board that they um, wrote what mindfulness means to them. And this is in their writing. There were three different scribes that day. What mindfulness means to them and how do they practice it. So it's really difficult to see, but calming, which is what we said, right? And breathing. So we're on the right track. And what's so great is our kiddos are learning this at a much earlier age than some of us have. Isn't this great? Aware. And then you see the scribe changed. Muscle memory, so that's that breathing again, right? Um, but this individual chose to draw a muscle. <laughs> and drumming, and so the drum set. So dr you made it into mindfulness, Nick. Drumming, and drumming together, because the kids do that. So it's being mindful in community. 
And I love paying attention, A-T-T-E-N-C-I-O-N, paying attention, paying attention, which is what we were saying. And then focus and listen, L-I-N-E-S-E-N, listen. And the arts, they talked about that it's singing, it's dancing, and nature isn't written down, but they talked about nature, being in nature. And so these are ways that our kiddos are learning about how, what is mindfulness and how to be mindful. Whoops, that's for later, so we'll leave that up. So I always like to then go to the experts, so to speak, to see what they're saying. And um, even though you probably thought I was being pretty smart with the title, um, Reclaiming the Present Moment and Your Life, it actually comes from a book that was written by uh, John Kabat-Zinn, and this is uh, Mindfulness for Beginners. And that's one of the things he describes as what mindfulness is is focusing or reclaiming the present moment and your life. But then he goes on to say that it's a prescription for living a more mindful life, and it seems simple enough. Return your awareness again and again to whatever is going on to help make a shift moment by moment into a more spacious, clear, reliable and loving connection with ourselves and the world. So I was sold, and I thought, you know, I always like to take time to dig in so that I better understand something and that I can apply it in my own life. And so where I took all this, including what the kids had to say, was um, to realize that Paying attention in the present moment means being on purpose. Somebody said intentional. Um, and being here and, and listening. And for those who were in that 47% a minute ago, it's paying attention in the present moment. In case you weren't paying attention in the present moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes you need to repeat these things. But it's then holding that presence with curiosity and compassion, and no judgment. And I had to really think that through from this quote from, from the expert to what does that mean to me about curiosity, being curious, not judging the thoughts you're having, not judging the experience that you're having, because you need to be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself first. You may have the thought, but that gives you an opportunity to take a look at what is the reaction, what is the emotion, why am I having this? And then, not planning for the future or lamenting the past. So this was where it got a little tricky for me because to be honest, that 47% for me where I'm not focused on the present is because all of these memories are back here or because I'm worried about all of these things coming up and I'm obsessed about the future. So I had to really take some time and be mindful about that. What, what does that mean that, that I, I am in the present moment but not really focused on the past or the future? And I'm reading a book um, that is the How to Live Your 12 gifts from God, which is about the 12 powers. And the chapter on zeal helped me with a reference to memories and how you can still focus on them because they're there and not have them drag you back. So here's what it says. There are two ways to deal with memories. They can drag you backwards so that you escape the present moment or you can bring them forward to experience in the memory, the experience of memory in the now, in the present, for spiritual purposes. So a memory may be what has triggered the current moment, the current thought, one of those 7,000 thoughts. But it's how we process that memory, processing it in the now, instead of allowing it to drag us back in to those emotions, that experience, bring that forward and process it as you are now. It 
feels like the same thing, sort of, but it's not. It's bringing it into the now, looking at it from the now perspective. And the same is true for you know, um, being obsessed with the future and allowing that to drag you away from the present. Something I try to do is really stop and say, okay, what, what is this? What is this that I'm feeling? What brought this here? Was it a, a, a memory? Was it something I'm focused on in the future? future? What brought this here? And with curiosity, with grace and kindness, look at what, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? Not judging it. Not judging why you're feeling it. Just acknowledging it. And then taking an opportunity to maybe refocus to the now with a positive intent. So I have a perfect um, example of this, a story I'll tell on myself. Um, I was walking my two dogs not too long ago, and um, I was irritated and anxious, and you know, I just really, every time they would stop, I would just think, well, okay, I don't have time for this, we really need to get going. And the sad part was, I said out loud, we're going for a walk, not a sniff. <laughs> <sighs> and, you know, that's not like me. I mean, they're my family, so I had to stop and really think, what, what is happening here? What's going on? And so, coming into the now, I had to refocus on, what am I doing? I am with my fur babies, who I have invited into my life, and in return, they give me unconditional love. You know, it's not their fault we don't have a yard right now, but that's a benefit, right? That's that little, oh, you don't have a yard right now, but instead it's, well, I get to be active. I get to be outdoors. I haven't spent this much out time outdoors in a long time but I get to be outdoors. And then I broaden that to look at this beautiful open space park that steps out my door, where I get to be with them. And I noticed that I went from this anxious and feeling my blood pressure rising to calm and smiling, and I felt so much better about where I was and what I was doing and about being with my, my family, my, my four-legged family, and I noticed that change in me. Nothing had changed about the environment, just that I was mindful of where I was. What can I be grateful for? And there's this great um, quote that is a, 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 from a Buddhist that says, our life is shaped by our mind for we become what we think. So I moved from being anxious and irritated to being calm and grateful and appreciative. So I demonstrated for myself that I had a choice. Even when I was in the current moment, being mindful of the current moment, I still could have said, yeah, but I don't have a yard, and all the circumstances that go along with that, but instead to take a positive approach of, I get to be outdoors more and exercise more. And it um, really leads me to this second quote that says, be where you are, otherwise you will miss your life. That life that's bursting out all over that Kath talked about. And we don't want to miss our life. I was missing my life. You know why? I was worried about all of the things on my to-do list, everything I had to get done, and um, being late to work, because now that school's back in, all this traffic, and that's where I was. So I had to come back into the present and experience and enjoy this moment, this life. So I've really determined that there's two ways of practicing um, mindfulness. There's a formal way and there's an informal way. There's, and it's and, it's both, right? So the formal way is meditation and lots of forms of meditation. Um, it can be 
a, an unguided meditation where you um, are setting and, and processing and breathing, focusing on breathing. It can be a guided meditation, which we'll do in a few moments. And within the meditation, you sometimes may want to do a body scan where you casually and gently scan all of the parts of your body and what is happening at the moment. Um, we'll incorporate that as well. Um, there's also um, walking meditation. Soon we will have our own labyrinth in the back. And walking meditation, right? And not just going for a walk or a sniff, going for a walk, but thinking about your movements, your steps, the miracle that we can step one foot in front of another, or that being outdoors, and sometimes it's also focusing on something as you're doing this. And I sometimes will focus on, what do I hear? Because all of a sudden I hear these birds. And I'm, not, I'm guessing they didn't show up just because I was there that day. They were probably there all the time. I just didn't hear them. It's kind of like that saying, stop and smell the roses. Well, sometimes we don't stop and smell them because we don't even notice they're there, right? So there's lots of ways of doing meditation. And if it sounds familiar, if a lot of you already do that, that is what's at the core of the unity practices. Meditation, being mindful. And if it's not something you're comfortable with and you want to start, remember, don't judge. Don't start and think, I can't do this. I, I'm doing it all wrong. I get distracted. I'm bringing in that future stuff and that past stuff. And it, Don't judge. Be kind to yourself. And then there's the informal, and that's sort of what my example was, right? Informal is how this, this practice, this formal practice begins to spill over into your day-to-day -day life. And that's kind of what I was doing, right? That was informal, just stopping where I was. You know, there's some other ways. Mindful eating. You know, this is a practice that some of the um, weight loss programs don't tell you they're telling you uh, to practice mindful eating, but they tell you, don't eat in front of the television. Savor. Think about what you're eating and the value it's bringing your body or not, because then maybe you'll stop eating so much of it. I just stopped all my buttered popcorn. <laughs> the popcorn, yeah, but it's just not as good without the butter. <laughs> but now I'm mindful of that. And mindful tasks. You know, this morning, uh, someone shared in the bookstore that they, they had to have their daily word and that they put it right there in front of the toilet because every morning <laughs> reminds them to be mindful for the day. That's a mindful task. Or showering, you know, I get in the shower and what am I doing? Planning my day and what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do. But to be mindful in some of your tasks, to think about the water and that we can regulate the, the water and that how it came to us and how it feels. And for me, you know, my family from Haiti, I've been to their home in Haiti prior to them moving here. And these five women had to carry gallons of water up a ladder to their outdoor bathroom to pour it in for showers. So when I'm mindful during a shower, I'm also grateful that the turn of a knob is bringing me this experience, right? That's mindfulness during our tasks. There's also mindful listening. Listen to someone else to understand where they're coming from, not to be understood. That's why we have two ears, one mouth, right? But, and it's just a little bit of being mindful. Am I listening, waiting for them to stop talking so that I can explain? Or am I really listening to what they're saying, what this means to me? Mindfulness speech was one that Lisa reminded me of, and this is one that they're doing in the um, children's garden. 
I don't know if you can read that, but mindful speaking is really thinking before you speak. And she used the acronym, acronym THINK with them, which means the T is for th- think about whether it's true. Before you say something, think about if it's really true. And then, is it helpful? It might be true, but is it really going to be helpful? And is it inspiring to that other person? Again, it could be true and helpful, but, you know, some, there's a time for everything, and maybe it's not very inspiring to that person to hear. And then, is it necessary? <laughs> is it a to- I told you so? Or is it really something that is necessary for you to be sharing with this person, saying to this person? And then use kindness. There's that kindness again. Kindness with others, kindness with yourself. And these two methods, the formal and the informal, really begin to blend together to build a life that is living and a life of awareness or a contemplative life, which I found something I'll share with you in a moment from Richard Rohr on that. But you know, um, to kind of encapsulate everything, I found something that says, mindfulness is like a love affair. A love affair with life, with reality and imagination. A love affair with the beauty of your own being, with your heart, your body, your mind, and with the world. That's what mindfulness is. That's how the spirit meets us here. So, you know how you always hear um, the, all the side effects to uh, prescription medicine on a commercial. You know, they're doing this commercial and all of a sudden the, this very cheerful voice comes on and tells you all these side effects and these warnings that you have to be aware of and they're saying it so cheerfully. Well, <laughs> I thought I would use that as a way to share with you the so what, right? We've talked about what it is and and, and how to practice, but what's the so what? What are the side effects that we need to know about here, right? So I've done it kind of in a, a mock voiceover from, uh, from like a commercial would go. So see what you think here. This is my version of the possible fa- side effects of practicing mindfulness. Those participating in mindfulness practice may experience extreme joy, sometimes accompanied by reduced blood pressure a strengthening of the immune system, unaccounted for energy, and in some cases, individuals have been known to experience common side effects such as an overall decrease in anxiety and depression and reduction of chronic pain. Do not practice mindfulness if you are allergic to sleeping well and an overall blissful outlook for the future. There's one more. (laughs) If you choose to practice mindfulness with a loved one, be cautious. Be cautious of the potential for higher satisfaction and closeness with one another. (laughs) Side effects we can live with, right? So before practicing this ourselves, I really wanted to share with you um, from Richard Rohr, who is an author you may want to uh, look up. He has a daily blog, and um, imagine this. This came on the day that Trish and I talked about me doing this this, uh, series. Thank you, universe. Um, It's called Waking Up to Life, and it says, the contemplative way of life is so-called because it's the way of life devoted to the cultivation of contemplative experience. That's our starting place. To contemplate means to observe carefully and to pay close attention. Most of the things that we notice, we notice in passing on our way to something else. Then every so often, something gives us reason to pause. Something catches our eye or draws our attention and we're drawn for a moment to ponder or to reflect on that which awakened us in this way. And so then he goes on to give some examples of moments in which we awaken to God's presence in the cosmic dance. 
He says, without warning, we find ourselves falling into the abyss of a star-strewn sky or find our heart impaled by a child's laughter or unexpected appearance of the beloved's face. Without warning, we lose our footing in the silence broken and in the breaking deepened by the splash of a frog that you hadn't even known was there. What is so extraordinary about such moments is that nothing beyond the ordinary is present. Nothing beyond the ordinary is present. It's just a starlit sky, a child at play. It is just the primal stuff of life that is unexpectedly broken through that mesh of opinions and concerns that all too often hold us in our spells. It is just life in the immediacy of the present moment before thoughts begin. Here in this unforeseen defenselessness is granted the contemplative experience. However obscure it may be, that we are, that, that is when we are the cosmic dance of God. The present moment, just the way it is, in the deepest actuality, the fullest union of of the union we seek with God or meeting, having spirit meet us here. And then he says, these moments pass. We're now in the 47% future of the past, or the past. These moments pass, and the real question then for us is, what happens next? All too often, unfortunately, nothing happens next. The gate to heaven opened, and your cell phone rang. (laughs) Or you're already late to a meeting, so you don't enjoy walking your dogs. Nothing happened next. But sometimes what does happen is that although the moment has passed, you reflect back on it, and you realize that the subtle moment was a kind of homecoming. You settled with a sense like, I belong here. When you start understanding your life in the light of these moments, you realize this feeling that you're skimming over the surface of the depths of your own life. It's all the more unfortunate because God's unexplainable oneness with us is hidden in the depths over which we're skimming. Then there's the gift of holy discontent. We say to ourselves, I don't like living this way. I don't like living exiled from this inner richness from the time to time visits. And this quickens us from within and instead we say, I want to abide in the depths so fleetingly glimpsed. And for us, we want to abide and reclaim the present moment and our lives. So you want to try this? Try one? All right. So Stephanie will actually take us into the moment. We'll do about 10 minutes of a, of a um, meditation. Um, and, uh, but Stephanie will first bring us into this moment and help drop us down into our center. And then we'll start. I am dropping down to the truth of who I am. I am dropping down, surrendering in love. I am dropping down. To the truth of who I am I am dropping down Surrendering in love So I'll invite you to start by 
finding a comfortable position, tall and straight back. And then lay your arms to rest gently. And when you're ready, if you haven't done so already, close your eyes. Bring your full attention to this very moment. This moment where we're settling in, allowing the mind and body to still. This moment we're taking in with openness and patience, and curiosity, while we bring our awareness to the breath. First, take in a deep breath in, and then release it fully. And then just follow the breath as it flows in and out of your body. Letting the breath settle. Allowing it to feel natural, easy. Don't try to force the breath or regulate it. It's just flowing naturally on its own. Now we're going to scan down the body. Concentrate your attention first on the top of your head and the scalp. Feeling whatever is happening in this area might feel tingling, heat, throbbing or soft vibrations. There may be a strong sensation or you might not feel much at all. Now lower your attention to your forehead, your face, and jaw. Allow the muscles here to relax. Just keep focused on your breath and how naturally it flows. And on your next out breath, let the sensation dissolve and lower your focus to the neck. Letting the throat and sides and back of the neck soften. Notice any sensation that arises on the surface of the skin or deeper within. Now bring your attention to your shoulders, noticing if there's any tension or strain. Breathe into your shoulders, and if any part feels tight, allow them to relax. Now staying in this moment, we extend our awareness down the arms toward the wrists, the palms, the fingers. And then on the next out breath, allow them to soften. Soften the arms, the wrists, the palms. And now come to the chest, observing the rise and fall of each breath. Noticing how the lungs expand and contract. And then direct your attention to your upper and lower back. There may be some intensity in this, in this area because it's where we commonly hold stress. And any discomfort you notice, just observe what is there, no judgment, only compassion for the life experiences that brought the tension. 
And with each breath you take, soften this area just a little bit more. And then moving to your focus around your abdomen, notice it expanding and filling with air and slowly emptying on the exhale. Again, not forcing the breath, just observing. And as you bring your attention to your pelvis, notice where your body makes contact with the chair. Direct your breath into this area, relaxing into stillness, feeling that chair. And now scan your legs, observing your thighs, noticing where they're making contact with the chair. And then lowering your attention to your knees, your shins and calves. Let your legs soften and release tension. Then when you're ready, breathe into your ankles, your feet, your toes. Let them relax and become soft, sinking into the state of relaxed awareness. As we near the end of the session, take a moment to notice how you feel. You may find you're more relaxed. It's often common to feel relaxation in meditation and why it's important to meditate when we're experiencing stress when we find our minds clouded over with overwhelm. And as we near the end of the session, bring your attention back to the room. Wiggle your fingers and toes. Slowly open your eyes. And as we sing this meditation with Stephanie, I invite you to bring this state of peace in to the rest of your day. I am dropping down, down to the truth of who I am. I am dropping Thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you found something meaningful in our service. If you'd like to learn more about us or make a donation in support of what we do here, visit unitydenver.org. Our Sunday service is at 10 a.m. every Sunday. We hope to see you sometime in person.